Here. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, welcome, everyone. We have a uh, crowd here this evening. Uh, on a monthly basis, when we get together as a school board, we have an opportunity to recognize two individuals, typically, that are our New Heights Award winner. Um, over the course of the month, uh, individuals get recognized and nominated to be uh, essentially almost like employees of the month. Um, last month, we didn't have a chance to, to do it because we were off campus. Uh, we had our school board meeting down at the uh, Ole Valley BCTC. And uh, tonight, so to make up for last month as well as this month, uh, there was several uh, support, some of our support staff, uh, crossing guards, bus drivers, paraprofessionals that were all nominated within the last month. And we thought it'd be really nice to be able to have a almost like a mini recognition for our key support staff that really helped to work with our students and keep the whole program going. So we have uh, several individuals we'd like to recognize this evening, and uh, I'm going to first start with Miss um, Donna. And so, Donna, if you don't mind coming up. Donna started as a paraprofessional para in late October. Donna knew she liked working with children, but had no prior experience working with them. From day, from day one, Donna started, Donna, oh, I'm sorry, from the day Donna started, we knew she was the right person for the job. She asked questions, connected in a positive manner with the staff and students, has brought the much needed energy to be successful in the position. Our group of students takes a special person to work with them and develop the rapport necessary to help them be academically, behaviorally, and socially successful. So Donna works with our life skills and autistic support children down in the elementary school, K to one. Donna hit the ground running, instantly connected with her, one -on with her students one-on-one. -on -one. Her personality, New York accent, <laughs> care <laughs> and compassion for our students is exactly what we needed all along. Donna is a true team player. Our students and staff are beyond fortunate to have her on our team. Tr Donna truly deserves to be recognized for all she does for our students and staff daily. Thank you Congratulations. So Thank you so much. And I think Ms. Kelly has a few uh, comments. I just add, uh, although this is Donna's first year at the elementary school, it really does feel like she's been there for years. She fits in so well with the staff. She, uh, are your strombolis famous? <laughs> <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently famous. Um, we got to test that out on a fun early dismissal day. Um, but the way that she connects with the students uh, and how they are just drawn to her and her uh, wonderful personality. Um, it's, we are truly blessed to have her at the elementary. So thank you for thank you, Ms. Kelly. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. So we have a little certificate for you. Oh, and sweet. also uh, you oh, will get a New Heights Award winner. Thank you so much. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. just an awesome personality to Mrs. Kent's bathroom and all her students just enjoy being with her every, every day. Next up, we'd like to recognize Ronnie Ginther. Ronnie is one of our power professionals in the uh, intermediate middle school here. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Ronnie Ginther, known to our students as Mr. G, has been an important part of the Brandywine community for as long as we can remember. He consistently demonstrates a willingness to support students, make meaningful relationship, relationships with them each year. Mr. G shows dedication and commitment in all he does. He extends his supportive nature beyond just the students. He readily offers help, a helping hand or a listening ear to faculty members as well. Those who are familiar with him find their days brightened by his presence. His warmth and willingness to assist and create a sense of positivity throughout the Brandywine community. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. He broke the mold when we got him. We got a pair. Thank you. Every day, bright smile on his face, helping every single person who comes across, the students, 
the teachers, just like what Mr. What Mr. Potter uh, just read, is always willing to help in every possible way inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And we're super proud and we're super lucky to have Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So same thing, we got a little strip yet. And I don't know if we got these one of these before. No, All right. Know. So this is the second time Mr. Uh, Ginther's been uh, recognized. And so this time he gets a new Heights Award mug. So congratulations. Thank sir. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And before you go, he always has sweet treats for different offices for the teachers <laughs> as well. And I know for a fact that they truly, truly, truly appreciate everything that he does every day. Thank you. Congratulations. Next up, we have uh, Carrie Sterner. Hello. Hi. Congratulations. So this is what was uh, recommended for Carrie. Carrie has been a paraprofessional within the district for many years. Carrie continues to show exceptional work ethic with all students that she works with. She goes above and beyond her required duties to make sure the students are happy, have the work completed, and are behaving. Carrie continues to look for materials outside the classroom that will work best for the students she works with on a daily basis. Her dedication and love for her students is evident in all aspects of her daily life. She has shown a lot of growth in her time working in the life skills classroom, and the students really enjoy and respect her. <laughs> when, I went to, when I went to present her, her award in class, she wanted nothing to do with it. She wanted no part of it. She's so incredibly humble. Again, working with, with, with our students in, that, in the classroom that she's in, she's super caring, super supportive. Again, going above and beyond, out of the realm of what most teachers and individuals would do. She, she just shows that love and support every single day uh, she, she's at work. We all appreciate it. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. And just knowing Carrie for two years, um, again, she does an amazing job with the students. Sometimes things are very challenging in those classrooms, and she still comes in every day. <laughs> <laughs> Which is grateful. Uh, next up, we'd like to recognize uh, Sue Sandham, who uh, works in our high school. Hi. Hello. Congratulations. Thank you. Miss Susie is so deserving of New Heights recognition for her dedicated work in the high school life skills classroom. Miss Susie goes above and beyond her day not only to ensure that her students are getting the best access to their education, but also feeling cared for and supported along the way. Not only does she do a phenomenal job in the classroom, but Miss Susie brings such a kind heart, positive spirit, and great energy every single day that rubs off on her students. You can tell she truly loves the work that she does and shows up every day for her students. She embodies our motto of students first and always goes, always goes above the call of duty, whether it's academically or cheering on her students in an after-school bocce match. We're so lucky to have Miss Susie at the high school supporting our students. I've seen Miss Susie every morning with the biggest smile on her face waiting to door to unlock and then an absolute bucket of snacks. <laughs> uh, and it really just speaks to how much she not only cares about the kids, but truly loves them. So she's, a, she's a wonderful part of our staff and such a resource for the kids in this and things classroom. So I really, really appreciate what you do. I do love it. <laughs> so here is a little certificate. Okay. As well as your own heights more. Oh, I'll have to use that now. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Known you for 15 plus years in this <laughs> building and then the high school. Yeah. So, again, um, this is well earned. That, that is correct. That was that long ago, right? So, her positive mindset, her um, positive attitude truly um, is displayed among all her classes and things that she interacts with. Her students love her and enjoy her. So, we are appreciative to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Sure, please. She used to have a different nickname, Daisy Sue. Daisy Sue, guys. And they, some of the kids in school still have a different nickname because she taught the Girl Scout Daisy program. 
back in the day. And just to give you an idea of the tenure of her commitment to young people in the Brandywine School District, and I know she did this long before she had my girls, but um, my daughter is 28 years old. <laughs> and she had Daisy Sue when she was a kindergartner, Daisy in the in the Girl Scout program. So long time. How long did you do that, Sue? Do you know off the top of your head? Thirty five years. Thirty five years. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done for this community. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy Sue. <laughs> Next, I'd like to uh, recognize Emily Meck. Hello. Congratulations. <laughs> Ms. Meck assumed the schedule of a power that has been with me on previous years. She slid into the new schedule flawlessly. She has shown support to the students in class. Most students readily approach her with questions and listen when she, when she prompts them to follow rules or complete work. She makes sure questions are answered, rules are followed, and students are on task. She has always supported me going above and beyond recently to ensure that an issue was handled. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, Ms. Mack is such an attentive resource for the students that she works with uh, across a number of subjects, math, history, and and it's, it's a tough age group sometimes, and, and she honestly is a, is a resource for those students, and, uh, and the number of times that I've been able to work or see her working with those kids, uh, they're drawn to her, and she connects with them uh, in a really, really positive way, and I think that that's an important piece when you're working with any student, uh, but you can see it just in the way that she's working with the kids, so she's a resource for all kids. And just to reiterate that, just starting this year and being in at the high school, not knowing whether, you know, where your role is going to fit, you took that um, Right, you know, Florence ahead, and um, you've been doing awesome. And I know the staff up there truly really appreciate your assistance. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. We're going to change gears here a little bit. And uh, again, part of our support staff group. Uh, and, you know, if I can just take a moment here, you, you hear the accolades of all these wonderful people, and there's a common thread and theme, and that's support. That's a, that's a love for children. That's a going above and beyond, the bringing the brightness to the, the work environment. And these, these staff that are being recognized, as well as all our support staff, do that on a daily basis. They really become the fabric of who we are as this school district. They bring that energy. They bring that personal touch. They're the ones working with our children to to get them through the the day to day, but also bigger picture to get them through this whole educational system and be successful in their lives. And so, uh, it's it truly is an honor to be able to do this tonight. Um, and this is a unique uh, twist to it. We we've really never done this before. But uh, I'd like to recognize some of our folks that kind of go above and beyond outside the classroom. Um, and the first one I'd like to re recognize is uh, Mr. Fred Snell, who is our crossing guard. <laughs> hey, sir. So this is the recognition that came in for Mr. Snow. Fred is an amazing crossing guard. He does not have an easy job, and he is diligent about helping students cross a, a very busy intersection on the main road. He rarely misses a day of work, and you will see him out in the rain or shine or even snow. Fred is always, always has a smile on, talking with the kids and giving them high fives as they cross. I am so appreciative that our students have Fred. Signed, Grateful Employee. <laughs> so we have a little uh, certificate here. And oh, a New Heights Award mug. And I think, uh, did you have a few things to say? Yeah. Um, so... For anybody who knows, Fred's been with us since August of 2016, I believe. Um, most most of us see him stationed at Herman's, uh, regardless, you know, rain, snow. Um, I always say, every time I drive by and it's cold out, I'm like, he's a stronger person than I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some things about him, uh, he's very much about being a good role model to our students. He does talk to them as they walk by. I would say he's probably one of the most dedicated crossing guards that we have had. 
Um, his unwavering commitment to ensuring the safety of our students, staff, and community members is truly commendable. His smile and sense of humor has not only made our crosswalk safer, but brightens the days of our students. And with that, I'm gonna share some quotes from some of the students. Wow. Um, he is really kind and caring. For Valentine's Day, he gave us little treats like goldfish and pretzels. He is just really, really, really nice. He lets me hit his stop sign when I walk by. <laughs> um, and following with that, he's really kind and caring man. I like that he lets me high five his stop sign. And I really like that if we are late, he will let the cars go by instead of making them wait. He's very nice. I wish that he could always be my crossing guard. He gives us hats and treats. Uh, he has a very colorful personality. He is very kind to us, and on holidays, he gives us treats. This must be the common <laughs> theme. <to> be here. <laughs> <clears throat> I am very glad to have him as a crossing guard. Uh, perhaps the, the last one is he is pretty funny. He gives us our own special names, and mine is Mr. Camo. And he also gives us special treats on holidays. <laughs> so <laughs> if you guys want a snack, you know where to find it. <laughs> but again. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> I, I, I just want to say something. Uh, I want to thank publicly. I don't know the Fleetwood Police. They make a hell of a difference. I'll tell you when they're there, it, it's it's uh, makes my job and everybody else. Kids feel safer. But it, the only other comment I have is when people ask me how many grandkids I have, I say seven plus about five to thirteen. Maybe a thousand more. <laughs> and look at go, What's wrong with this guy? <laughs> but anyway, thanks everybody. <laughs> and finally, I have Mr. Mike. Mr. Mike, come on up here. <laughs> So uh, let me read the uh, recognition for Mr. Mike. Now, Mr. Mike is one of our brand new bus drivers this year. Wife of Donna, or husband of Donna. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that we had an amazing bus driver from the moment I mess met Mr. Mike. After our son got on the bus for the first day of school, he said, don't worry, mom, I've got him. He instantly put my heart and mind at ease, and I knew that our son was in good hands. Mr. Mike greets the children on his bus with a smile and a positive attitude every morning. It's a wonderful way for our kids to start their day. Mr. Mike is a kind and compassionate, and you can tell that he genuinely enjoys his job. We are very thankful to have Mr. Mike as our bus driver. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm the student transportation operations manager for Brandywine Heights School District out of the Car Christ lot. Michael comes in every morning with the same energy as he does on his bus. So all the drivers <laughs> notice that. It big good mornings and see you later and have a good night. Um, I knew he was special when the first month of school, I was continually getting emails and phone calls about, thank you for putting him on bus three. He's a great improvement. Um, my kids love him. I feel safe with him on the driver. And then I also knew when I drove his old run that he had the end of last year. We miss Mr. Mike. <laughs> so, and then I also had a child the one time I drove that run. I get to start riding with Mr. Mike again next week because I'm going back to Brandywine. Oh, so, aw. you make a very huge impact on these Give children. I'm glad to have you as part of the team. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you everybody. So, we get the bookend uh, with both. Uh, married couple, Donna working as a paraprofessional, Mike working as a bus driver, uh, a fitting way to uh, close out this, but it, it truly is a testimony again to all the wonderful uh, folks that we have here working with our students on a daily basis. They make such a positive impact and I am so grateful. Congratulations to all of you. Um, there are a few snacks and refreshments. Um, there's some drinks over there, uh, a couple snacks if you wanna grab those. Um, you are more than welcome to stay. If you would like to exit left, you are more than welcome to exit left. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, and congratulations.
In both the intermediate and middle schools, we will have a spirit week from April 15th to April 19th. For fifth grade in math, they are using formulas to calculate the volume and of 3D shapes. Over in science, they just wrapped up a unit on patterns in space, which included learning about moon phases. Currently in language arts, the students are working on text-dependent analysis essays to enhance their response to literature writing abilities. In reading class, they are in the final stages of lit circles for this year, for this year, where students will be creating sim symbolism mini posters to show their understanding of sim symbolism in their books. Mrs. Mullis's class is reading the book number, The Stars. Additionally, in social studies, they are exploring the history of French and Dutch explorers. The students will be utilizing Canva to craft presentations. In fourth grade, on April 11th, they will have a field trip to the Berks Nature Preserve. On April 19th, the whole school will have an early dismissal. From April 23rd to the 25th are the ELA PSSAs. From April 30th to May 1st are the math PSSAs. And in fourth and eighth grade, on, eight, on May 2nd, are the science PSSAs. Finally, the IS Reading Olympics team has been practicing for the competition, which occurs on May 9th. Um, in the high school, during the first week of April, 21 students and two teachers went on a trip to three national parks in Utah and Arizona and got back Sunday from a great trip. In the music department, the band and choir will be performing on April 26th after school for senior citizens to prepare for their concert on the 28th of April. The junior senior prom is May 10th at Hotel Bethlehem, and many students are beginning to make and share their choices about the next steps for college, career, and military as decisions are made in the spring. In high school sports, the spring season has begun. Starting with baseball, the team has played five games so far this season, winning one and losing four, and are playing again today, looking for a win against Antietam. Softball has played six games. Sorry, just interrupt real quick, sorry. But I got an update from the superintendent over at Antietam said, you guys are killing us. <laughs> Send a score of 0-19. to 19. Oh. So I think they'll probably pick up another win. I'm okay, sure. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, softball has played six games so far, winning three and losing three, and their next game is at home tomorrow on April 9th. Boys tennis has already had six matches, winning two and losing four, and they will also be playing tomorrow. The high school track and field team lost their first meet, but they will be competing again tomorrow against Topahawken. And finally, boys volleyball has started strong, playing six games, winning five, and losing only one. They have a game tomorrow as well against Antietam. Lastly, in the elementary school, last Thursday, April 4th, the elementary school hosted its first summer safety night. Mr. Miltenberger coordinated this cool event that included a ton of practical activities, such as building a first aid kit, learning about wildlife from the PA Game Commission, looking at some gear used by PA State Police, learning about swim and safety, swim safety, and a scooter gym swim, and also learning about knot tying and fishing. There were some great raffle prizes too. On Friday, April 12th, the elementary school will host Teddy Bear Day. Local pre-K and daycare students are invited to join the kindergartners for teddy bear activities and snacks in the cafeteria as a transition opportunity for those coming to kindergarten next year. There are about 35 students expected to attend. And finally, the third grade PSSAs will begin on April 23rd. More information is on the website. How was the uh, trip? I know you were on the trip. Oh, it was fun. What was, it was the best part? What was the best part? What was the best part? I liked Bryce Canyon the most. And then we did a, uh, like float on a boat down the Colorado River, and that was beautiful, too. So, it was a lot of fun. You had snow in Bryce Canyon, right? Grand Canyon. There was some snow, and it was all cloudy, so that one wasn't very easy to see. <laughs> so, but it was still fun, yeah.
Okay, I apologize. I have a little bit of a cold, so I will try my best to keep my voice. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about hockey, obviously. Um, you have a group of families that truly care about the school district and specifically the team. <clears throat> but when we asked for equal competitive facilities, it feels like we were abandoned and sent to another school district. Um, last year, or this past season, Kutztown won one game. And so it's very hard for us to be excited to be moving forward to a team like that. <clears throat> we will do our best to um, make the best of it, but it's very hard to get excited. Um, for those of you that don't know, Ole and Emmaus <clears throat> both won state championships in field hockey this past fall. And KU won the NCAA championship. And somehow we are struggling <clears throat> here in th this area. Why is there such a black hole here? Um, there are four young women on the U.S. field hockey team from this area that will be participating in Paris this summer from Berks County, and we're eliminating our team. There are so many girls that have moved on from Brandywine Heights to play at a higher level, but we're going to take opportunities away from these girls. <clears throat> My frustration is that this school district always has the mantra of students first, but we're going to eliminate another opportunity. While other high school teams in the entire county will practice at their school district, we're going to send our families with an inconsistent schedule bouncing around the county to play or practice. While the girls are super excited to have the turf facilities at KU, the unknowns with the practice facility is very scary. <clears throat> as far as claims of low numbers, we've consistently been at the same number. Um, we're in no worse shape than any other team at Brandywine. In some cases, the teams are worse than us. We can feel the team every game and have subs. But those teams are going to stay here at Brandywine Heights while we get shipped off. Um, I know that it's because of facilities, and that was a big discussion in the fall. And we're going to improve them partially with the grass field and the, the all-weather track. Please, please, please consider... <coughs> changing your decision for that, if at all possible. The grass field would have, or a turf field would have benefited eight teams here at Brandywine. Instead, only four for the grass. You lost opportunities to host youth events, invitationals, championships, and tournaments. That's revenue lost. <clears throat> when most school districts that are touching our borders are thriving, needing to add on building, including the one I work in, we are shrinking, and that's a problem. Why is that? We are number two in, in taxes, and we don't have very much to show for it. We need our alumni to be proud, proud that they come back and support the Ed Foundation, and we don't have that. It's hard and disheartening to hear families say that they don't want to deal with this place much more, and they only have two years left. As a former board member, that's very painful to hear. My kids were so excited to go to the high school, only to discover that there is not very much school pride. It's been difficult to watch that light go dim. Athletics are 50% of my kids' lives as, as student athletes, but we don't seem to invest in them here. We have 11 girls attending a summer camp this summer. That's amazing for our tiny little school district. And a lot of that is because of parent involvement and support. <clears throat> I recently sat at a meeting where there were about 30 families represented, and all of them were frustrated and felt like they couldn't come here and voice those frustrations because it falls on deaf ears. It's probably too late for my two kids, but I strongly consider, uh, urge you to consider adding athletics as a topic at every board meeting. Please do a lot more to encourage school spirit and pride other than just wearing an outfit because right now there is not much pride. That could have changed. You could have had a chance to change that, but we're instead dropping a team and paying for what I consider subpar facilities. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Erin Clark. Um, I wear multiple hats. Um, I am the president of the Sports Booster Club, and I also have a daughter that will be uh, that currently plays on the field hockey team. Um, I have a slightly different take um, because I feel like in a lot of ways the decision has already been made. And I just want to make sure moving forward, if this is the route that we're going, that we make sure we get the details right. Um, if the purpose of this co-op is to grow our program, then the details really matter because we want to continue having girls and gaining girls every year so that we can feel the team possibly have JV. We don't want to lose girls. And ultimately we will because some will choose not to participate in the co-op. But you know, the things that matter to them, turf, the surface is super, super important, which check that box. That is definitely huge. But in addition to that, practice times, practice facilities, traveling all over the county adds to their school day, takes away from their studies just to play. We need a consistent schedule for them. Um, in addition to the fact that they play other things or have other commitments too. Um, and I know typically practice schedules don't come out to the start of the season, but this is unlike any other arrangement we have. Most of our students are practicing here or at the middle school. They're not traveling for practice. Um, in addition to that, I think that this is feels like more of a partnership. Um, in typical co-ops, um, especially volleyball, we offer that here at Brandywine. Kutztown does not. Um, therefore, their girls come to us and we provide that. Football is offered at Kutztown. We do not offer that here. We have existing programs here. We each offer that. So joining together feels more of a partnership. If we're paying half of that turf or portion of that payment, I feel like we should be able to work together and have a stake in a little bit more than just an assistant in how we continue to grow and build the program. I think that it, you have to start fresh and start over. And I think that's important for our girls to feel welcome and involved and then continually grow a program. Um, they've had the opportunity to grow a program and they're in the same situation that we sort of feel like we're in. So I, I really want to take that opportunity to, to look at a fresh start for both schools. Um, I think that basically covers the major concerns that I have. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Kate Harms. Um, I have a daughter who's, uh, she's a junior now, so her last uh, year will be next year for the field hockey program. I also coached our middle school for three years. So uh, it's something I've been following for a while, something I've been part of as both a parent and a coach. And um, you guys probably got my email, right? I sent an email to everybody. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm just going to reiterate the same thing. So definitely what Kim had said, um, a concern I probably didn't bring up enough in, in my email is definitely like, yeah, it's tough. Kutztown, um, has been the worst uh, team in field hockey in the country, in the county for God a while. Um, so yeah, it's, we're sending our kids to a program that is not a good program. So that that's rough as a parent. Um, they also do not have great facilities there at all. We will have the better facilities and currently do have the better facilities as, as funny as that is. So if things fall through with being able to find space for them, it defaults to their school and that's a step back. I would like to congratulate the um, agreement that we got with Kutztown University. I think that's fantastic. I wish there was a way we could, as both school districts, keep our teams separate um, and be able to work with that, if, even if there's a way to split it and we only get so many home games or something. Um, again, I worry if we do this co-op, we are going to lose the program permanently at Brandywine. And I feel like we have not tapped into opportunities in the last you know, a few years to be able to really use our alumni and to be able to show what we can do with, you know, mo more motivated coaching staff 
and uh, more communication amongst the, the parents, the admin. We have a whole new athletic department, too, that's, you know, we're barely getting caught up to speed with everything. And I feel like we're jumping the gun on this decision. This is a big decision. Uh, field hockey is a big culture here in Berks County. Um, it's tough to see uh, one school get eliminated in the program. And it is kind of getting eliminated. I know you guys look at it as a co-op, but in time, I, I feel like it will eventually fade. Um, we will lose that uh, bit of field hockey here. And, you know, me and Kim still play field hockey at our age. You know, it's a big thing with the Olympics and everything to grow the game, you know, to support uh, women's sports. You know, if anybody learned from, you know, basketball lately, you know, women's sports are finally taking a hold. It stinks to have to lose something. And I do feel like we're jumping the gun. If there was a way to rework this partnership. I mean, I'm shocked. We always talked that Brandywine would hold the co-op, if anything. So I am a little shocked that it's going to Kutztown. I hear what Erin is saying, and I think some of her concerns are, again, if we might need a fresh start because Kutztown themselves has not been having a great program and we're kind of sending our talented girls there who's who's sticking up for them. So those are all things I just, you know, wanted you to consider. I don't know if this decision is 100% made and this is not a worthwhile conversation, but I figured I would just say something. Again, I am very um, excited that there was an agreement made with Kutztown University. Um, I wish we could take part on it, part of it without eliminating our program here. Um, and again, you know, just to really have good communication and really work on things to help build. There's alumni that would be great for helping us um, that have wanted to help for years. And I think that could spark some interest, too. It, I don't know. It'd be nice to try some things for a couple of years to see if if this really needs to get collapsed or we just haven't tried yet. So thank you guys for your time. I know I've talked a lot about it, so sorry, but just trying to represent the kids. So. We have a couple items under a uh, board of directors report this evening. The first is the meeting minutes from our March 4th meeting. Again, that meeting was held down at the BCTC only. Um, any adjustments or corrections that need to be made to those meeting minutes? Okay, none being said, once those are approved tonight, those will be the official meeting minutes for the school district. We have a uh, first reading. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I had asked a question about the uh, uh, Supreme Court decision for homeless support. Did you call that? You know, I didn't know who they were. I'm oh, McKin McKinney Vento. Yes. I'm just wondering why did we have to acknowledge that or approve that? Let me go back to my thoughts. I believe that. McKinney Vento approval was for a grant that the district had received. Mm -hmm. I think it was for a grant the district had. What was it for? Mrs. Kirsch. Yeah. That's, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So it, any student that becomes homeless in the school district, the, the, any resident Correct. The law is that, let me just make an example. <clears throat> There's a student that becomes homeless and they move to Oli. Um, we have to, you work with that other school district and you split the transportation. Uh, that, that family, that student has the right to choose to go to Oli or that has the right to choose to go to Brandywine. They can pick which school they want to go to. We have, we have 
we have a lot of obligation to have to transport that child. And then those transportation costs get split between the two school districts. So if we were to relocate to Holy, we still want to come back to the city of Brandywine. They, they are. Do the transport the child and Holy would help pay out that cost. That's correct. Okay. Yep. That's it. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't follow up with you on that one. That's that's my fault. My apologies. Thank you. Yep. No, good question. Any other questions specifically about the meeting minutes or homelessness or anything like that? Okay. Um, so we have some first reading policies tonight. Uh, there are uh, a few of them on here, uh, one to six. Really, there, there's only a couple that are up for some revisions. Uh, the first four, summer school, adult education, class size, and assessment system are just a uh, policy review cycle. There's no revisions being suggested for those. There's no revisions from PSBA on those. Uh, the homework policy, 130, there are a few slight corrections or adjustments that, that are being made to that policy. Um, if you remember about two years ago, we went through a process where we had a homework um, committee that had parents, teachers, administrators that all really tore homework apart and really examined what's the philosophy, what do we want from homework. And so this policy and adjustments here are reflective of that work. That work has been put into practice this school year um, with, with our student handbooks and what our teachers are doing with homework. But the policy now reflects that with those changes. So that's the homework policy adjustments. Um, as you peruse that, there's there's not a ton of significant changes, but just wanted to, to point that that's the reason for the changes. Uh, the second one is uh, telework. Uh, that is a uh, policy that uh, came into play uh, a few years ago. And really the, the key change to this is that the, uh, em the, the, res the employee is responsible for a high-speed internet connection if they're going to be doing work from home. So that's the adjustment that's being made to that policy. Um, it also makes mention that employees should be aware of their presence in meetings and backgrounds uh, when working remotely. <clears throat> and then they have to be able to have privacy so in order to have productivity. So those are the key changes that are being recommended for that policy. Any questions on those policies? Okay. Uh, under second reading policies, uh, we have uh, four of them there, current events, field trips, extracurricular activities, and concussion management. Uh, there was some back and forth uh, about the extracurricular policy since last school board meeting. Uh, uh, Mrs. Hewn and, and I had been uh, corresponding, and it was particularly around the uh, activity fee um, section in that policy. Uh, we had uh, taken a, a few bullet points and had them uh, struck out and then basically had consolidated, consolidated that language to be uh, inclusive of what we interpreted to be uh, redundant language. So there was language in, in there that said, um, high school and middle school clubs are extra and other extracurricular activities, seventh through 12th grade, uh, for which there is a paid advisor will require a fee for participation. So if you have a paid advisor, there's a fee. Two bullet points down, it then further goes on to say, academic and service-oriented clubs are exempt from the fee. So they kind of contradict each other. And so we, we kind of mesh those two in together to be able to create the statement that we have now, which is high school, middle school clubs, including academic and service-oriented clubs, are exempt from the fee. Uh, a a service-oriented club promotes productivity and meaningful experiences for students that develop in, uh, social and learning leadership skills while contributing to a worthwhile cause, our community, and identify our uh, identify. Uh, our school. So that's that's kind of like the mesh in the language. I just wanted to bring that up that there was some conversation. I don't know if you want to add anything or if that helps. Yeah, I, I'm just um, looking for clarification to make sure we all understand what is subject to the activity fee and what isn't. Back in the day, I, I think Mr. Sheets will remember, I mean, he ran a committee 12 or 14 years ago to initiate the activity fee. And the idea was that um, the board at that time felt like it was reasonable for families to contribute um, to the athletic program up to $60. And that gets kids access to coaches and facilities and uniforms and equipment and um, entry fees to meets and competitions and all that kind of good stuff. Additionally, at the time, the philosophy was, and 
feel free anybody to correct me if I'm uh, if you feel like I'm misstating this. But based on my understanding, the philosophy was if you were involved in a club that was tied to academics or tied to um, service or orientation. So like the key club, which fundraises and then donates their proceeds to um, community events or, or school functions, um, those clubs would be exempt from the fee. But if you were in um, sort of a club that was a passion, if you will, not an academic and not service oriented, and the district was funding an advisor, then it, you'd be subject to the activity fee. So to be clear, that is still what we're implementing or no? Uh, yes, that is what we're implementing. But the bullet that says if it's an academic or service oriented club and there is a fee, they're exempt from it. So essentially those two have been washing themselves out so in practice, all of our clubs have been deemed, this is a question, have, it sounds like all of our clubs have been deemed either academic or service oriented. Correct. Yes. Okay. And that is not my interpretation of what this board approved back in the day and what we asked the district to implement. So if we're changing that based on current practice, I think we need to be very clear that that's a change, that it's based on practice, not what the original um, desire of the board at the time that implemented the activity fee was. And in addition, I just wanna comment, we also said that any student or student's family who qualifies for free and or reduced lunch would be exempt from any activity fee whatsoever because the board didn't want a student not to be able to play or participate in any club or sport, anything affiliated with the school because of financial um, barriers. So, um, If I may just add to that, there are currently no clubs at the high school level that are not academic or service oriented that ha that don't have a paid advisor. So our more social clubs like the Cascade Brigade, there's no paid advisor to that. So those were exempt under the existing policy that was uh, approved earlier. Those did not have an activity fee either because they had no paid advisor. So currently at the high school, the only clubs that exist are academic and service oriented clubs, which were exempt uh, from the activity fee. And then there are also non-academic, non-service oriented clubs. And none of those existing clubs have a paid advisor. Since they do not have that paid advisor by the district, those students under the existing policy would not have paid an activity fee either. So we don't have uh, any clubs that have a paid advisor, but are not academic or service oriented. That makes sense. Yes. There, there's a list in the financial section. Um, it's business E6. If um, folks want to take a look at it, that's what I'm um, paying attention to here. And as you go down that list, these are clubs that at least have money in the account or have the ability to have money in the account. Um, so many of them obviously are tied to either sports or academics, honor societies, you know, FBLA, future educators, the class years, um, all of those. So it, it sounds to me like we are changing our, our policy based on the fact that today we don't have any clubs that have paid advisors that are not either academic or service oriented. The question would become if some student wants to implement a knitting club, no offense to anybody who knits, I'm just trying to think of an example that somebody could argue is not academic and is not, um, service learning oriented. If somebody wanted a knitting club and we approved that there'd be a paid advisor for the knitting club, 
under this revision to the policy, those students participating in the knitting club with a paid advisor would not have to pay a fee. So Mrs. Hume, let me, let me just, because I hear what you're saying, and that is a good loophole that could happen. It's not the current situation. So the second bullet that's crossed out right now, I think if we tweak it just a little bit, we'll capture what the concern is. And so if we say high school and middle school clubs and extracurricular activities, which are not academic or service oriented, oriented uh, which there is a paid advisor, will require a fee for participation. That's true. I'm saying we should add that back in. I think so. Tweak, tweak the language and add that in there. So if it one more time for middle, us. high school and middle school clubs and extracurricular activities, which are not academic or service oriented, which there is a paid advisor for which there's a paid advisor, yeah, for which um, will require fee for participation. Yeah, is that good? Yeah. So now we have athletics, there's a fee. If it's an academic or service-oriented club with the paid advisor, they're not, they're not charged. But if there is another club that is not academic or service-oriented and a paid advisor, then we will charge the fee. Is that fair? That's a, I think that's solved what our goal and intention for that originally was. Okay. And, Great. To, and to clarify, we actually do have a high school knitting club. Do you really? Oh, please, no offense. Somebody make another example. That's <laughs> yeah, glass one. So we will add that as a final review of this policy. We'll add that language in there, and I'll make sure the board gets a copy of that. Okay. Perfect. Good. All right, moving on. Hello. Um, the BCIU board met on March 21st. I have um, a number of bullets identified in the written report. I do actually want to take just a, as quickly as I can, just a few minutes to highlight a handful of things. I tried to organize the bullet points um, by operations and then the more fun stuff programs. So operationally, it's important to um, acknowledge and announce that the BCIU financial audit passed with flying colors, no concerns whatsoever. Ever. Um, the board is um, paying attention to transportation issues because uh, Reading School District, um, which was a significant contract for the BCIU in terms of uh, school bus transportation pr provision, Reading School District has gone in another direction. Um, as of uh, July 1st. So that has ripple effects throughout the organization in terms of buses and facilities and people. Um, they're they're um, in the process of trying to dispose of school buses. So we don't have an in-house um, school bus asset, if you will, but if um, the appropriate folks here at Brandywine may wanna give Christ Transportation a heads up that if they need buses, there will be a lot of used buses available for sale from the BCIU um, currently and in the coming months. I, I did for it. Yeah. Super. Okay. Um, there's a facilities review and feasibility study underway um, for a variety of reasons, um, not the least of which is the Antietam School District was looking for space as a result of the flood that occurred last summer. The BCIU had offered to vacate space of theirs to accommodate Antietam School District. That uh, deal has again gone in a different direction, but it triggers the opportunity for the BCIU to undertake an entire facilities review. Um, and interestingly, from an HR perspective, one of the things we talked about as a board is um, that we talk a lot about employee retention and employee acquisition, um, but it, as it relates to employee retention, um, they've implemented a program of what they call stay interviews. So everybody's familiar with exit interviews when employees leave. Um, the opposite of that is a stay interview and it's conversation you have with um, your most valued employees to find out what it is about your organization and your people that makes them want to continue to work for you. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that, those conversations I thought was really interesting was 
their um, more junior folks were looking for opportunities for more leadership development and, uh, um, training. And so the BCIU listened to that and is implementing an emerging leaders program where, where those folks who have expressed interest in developing their leadership skills and traits are going to be paired with an in-house mentor and then go through a series of three 90-minute um, uh, collaborative classes where they can um, learn and grow their leadership uh, skills. So if um, our HR folks are interested in um, the details of how you do a state interview and what that process might look like and what the um, value of it is, I have information on that. Um, the BCIU um, rolled out its comprehensive plan, which of course is required. Brandywine does the same thing and we board approved that previously. Um, three mandated trainings, I'm sure we've gotten them into our professional development, but one has to do with culturally relevant and sustaining education. One has to do with professional ethics and the other was structured literacy. And that mandated checklist document, which I've circulated previously, this is just the summary um, of, of all the mandated document or mandates that school districts have to go through. Um, that training has been incorporated in this uh, checklist. Now to the good stuff in terms of programs. Um, Career Ready Burks. This is um, a series of videos, five videos across a variety of different career pathways. These videos highlight the professional landscape and diverse career opportunities across Berks County. So again, if you've got um, folks, you know, headed towards the workforce locally or folks trying to decide what kind of career path they might want to take. These videos are free and available to students, families, parents, educators, counselors, etc. I have the link to them here. Um, another similar program is called Level Up Berks Education Pathways. This particular program is designed to try and draw candidates into the education career path because of the teacher shortage and the fact that um, public education is struggling to backfill positions. This is a um, staffing work group from across the county that meets monthly. It includes the five colleges and universities here in Berks County, and they're going to do a, a campaign in the fall, which we'll probably talk more about um, as that time approaches. But again, it's pretty cool work. Um, that the BCI is leading. And then the um, two final things I wanted to mention, there was the Berks County Agriculture Workshop, which um, Mr. Pottinger did share with us in our weekly update. Um, so that was held March 20th. And so you got to see a feed mill and you got to see a dairy farm. Okay. Yeah, all sorts of interesting agricultural stuff, but obviously because we're launching an ag program here, um, I'm you know delighted that you all were able to take advantage of that. What, one interesting thing, so both of those organizations, um, one is a sixth generation family business and the other is more than a hundred years old. So clearly it's in their blood. <laughs> Farming is in their blood. And then the final thing I did want to pass along, we talk a lot about um, mental health and we've also funded uh, a good bit around um, the mental health um, crisis, if you will, or situation. The BCIU has put, put together a, a website that aggregates um, all sorts of resources. Um, again, free and publicly available to students, families, um, uh, educators, counselors. Um, and what, they're, what they additionally, beyond just putting it together and making it available, now they're trying to make sure people know about it. So hopefully folks on our side have gotten these little business cards and these little postcards to tack around the building. So this is a great way to, you know, your, your teenage child's friend is clearly struggling. These are resources, for example, that any of us could um, connect that struggling person to. So if you need more, just, just ask. Super. Okay. Um, so lots going on at the BCIU. Um, I appreciate you indulging me for a couple of minutes. Thank you. If there's no questions, the next meeting is this next Thursday. Thank you, Mr. Uh, BCTC, Sir Eisenhower. Uh, BCTC met at the East Campus March 27th. 
March 26th through April 2nd, BCTC was closed for spring break. The CDL program has gone from a one-on-one -on -one training program to a one-on-two -on -two training program to cut down on costs. Uh, Senator Tracy Paniak got a BCTC a grant for $150,000. Um, April 22nd through May 19th, the horticulture spring plant sale will be going on. Thank you. Thank you. So attached, you'll see there was a one page summary from, I would say, a very brief meeting that we had on March 28th. Uh, it was about a half hour long. Um, You'll see we reviewed the financial statements through February, as well as had an update regarding business privilege tax and delinquent EIT prosecutions. Uh, the next meeting will be on Thursday, June 27th. Good evening. Uh, our meeting is tomorrow. We will be meeting with Mrs. Hannah Barrick. She's the executive director of PASBO and she'll provide a summary to us um, in regards to the governor's proposed budget and his legislative priorities for education in the next year. Thank you. Bright and early. <laughs> policy committee, Mr. Right now. Uh, tonight we had the first read in policies of policy 124, 125, 126, 127, 130, and 309. We had second reading policies of 119, 121, 122, and 123. Thank you, sir. Strategic planning and goals, Ms. Eisen. Uh, the end of year goals presentation will be um, in the next, the May school board meeting um, as we get ready for the end of year evaluations. Thank you. Negotiation and compensation. Um, that is also me. So we have had um, a couple meetings uh, internally and meeting with Bahia. Um, we had our first committee meeting on uh, February 27th. Uh, I'm sorry, our first meeting with Bahia on February 27th. And then we had an internal meeting on March 14th. And then we met with Bahia again on uh, March 21st. We are still trying to get um, some schedules coordinated for another meeting with Bahia, we're hoping for next week. So. Thank you. Uh, building construction. So uh, two big things just to note, uh, get it on everyone's radar uh, as well as the public. The uh, stadium project timeline, uh, the last day to submit substitution request is uh, this coming week on April 11th. Um, so that's an opportunity for any bidders that want to substitute something, let's just say lights, uh, they have to submit a rec uh, request to do so uh, to ensure that it matches uh, the requirements that we're looking for in the bid. Uh, the bid opening is on April 25th. Uh, and then the goal would be to analyze that and hopefully be able to uh, uh, vote or consider that at the May 6th school board meeting. So that's the first item of note. The second item of note is... Um, the DEP Berks Conservation District permit uh, meeting was held uh, this past Monday with the DEP uh, to talk about the uh, the permit application process. Uh, we are hopeful that the, that will uh, that it goes through a series of uh, review letters, but we're hopeful that has been resubmitted. And we're hopeful that will um, be able to be reviewed and back to us within the next uh, about month to be able to have final approval on that permit for the project. That's a key process to this because we need the permit in order to proceed with the project uh, and we truly need that permit in order to approve a contractor because that really signals the project to move forward so um, more to come on that i'll keep everyone posted uh, along that process could you summarize just high level what what was the rub about the permit like what is their pushback and what are we doing to accommodate or correct to make sure that they're satisfied. So it was interesting. There was 75 issues. It's a lot of issues. When we got on the phone with DEP, they didn't realize that we were putting a soccer field in a place where there's an existing soccer field and a track in a place where there's an existing track. So the existing track is already considered impervious surface because it's gravel. We're going to put a track on top of the impervious surface. They were under the impression that it was a just 
raw natural field that we were going to be cleaning off and creating this whole new. So one of the stipulations were we had to build the field 15,000 square feet at a time. That would have taken forever to try to create a soccer field. So um, once we level set and probably some fault our own that we didn't completely specify that it's an existing and obviously on their part, part to do some research to see that any kind of Google map that it's already a, a soccer field. So once we got on the same page, which that was a critical meeting to get on the same page, it really came down to nine issues. Um, and so they're, they're working. One of them is like plantings in the uh, water, in the uh, retention basin. They want to make sure that there's a certain type of planting that goes in that retention basin. So things like that are the questions at this point. So you read is that there's no major red lights or um, showstopper type items. That was my takeaway and walk away from that meeting is that they were definitely willing to work with us. Um, Berks Conservation District is a little bit more behind. They said it might take like about three weeks or so to get to the project review. Um, DEP said they're only about two days behind right now. So surprisingly, they'll be able to turn it around pretty quick once it gets to the first conservation district. So just whether you want to know this or not, but for your edification, Berks Conservation District can approve most projects. If there's projects that coordinate with any high quality water, water streams, like if we were going to do something out here or high school, ironically enough, is considered a high quality water stream because it feeds into Toad Creek eventually. Um, Berks Conservation District does the initial review, but that's why DEP gets involved. If it wasn't for that aspect of it, we wouldn't be dealing with DEP. We'd just be dealing with the Berks Conservation District. So that that's kind of how that process works. That's why we have both parties involved. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, can I get a roll? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 All right, moving on to business and operations report. Um, I'm going to pull out uh, letter J from the report so I can get a uh, motion and a second for all items. Uh, so, yeah. so, do we want to pull it out or just vote on separately? Yes, so much. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Uh, for the business and operations report, we'll start with the bills list. Items A through D are the bills. Item A is the general fund bills, totaling $1,227,033.97. Item B is to approve the food service fund bills, totaling $39,499.61. Item C is to approve the construction fund bills, totaling $11,462.25. Item D is to approve capital reserve bill, totaling $1 per business D. Uh, just to clarify and provide a short explanation. So the $1 was essentially we opened our funds uh, with FCCB, so they needed some sort of money to open the account. So we just issued a check for a dollar for all the funds. And then moving on to the financial reports, uh, item E, we have the general, well, the revenue and expense reports in numbers one, two, three, and four for all the funds. And then we have the investment schedule and the student activity and trust fund reports. So moving on to special ed, uh, we have one item. We have we are asking you to ratify a two-year agreement uh, with the dates of February 2024 through February of 26 with RHA Health Services, com formerly known as Salisbury Behavioral Health, to provide student support services as attached. As in prior years, there's no cost associated with this agreement. So moving on to curriculum and technology, item one, we're asking you to ratify a one-year agreement July of 24 through June of 25 with first light for E-rate eligible internet services at a rate of $1,160 per month. Uh, the prior year or the, pr the prior year rate was $1,335 a month. Uh, the reason why we're asking you to ratify this, even though it has not began, 
we had to sign it in advance to engage in the cooperative opportunity to lock in that rate. Moving on to item two, we're asking you to approve an MOU with Clipstown University uh, to allow a placement of the two KU graduate intern reading specialists in the district at a cost of the district of an annual amount of, well, not to exceed for $15,500 per student. Uh, this is the price that we are currently paying this year as well. Moving on to facilities maintenance. Uh, the first item we're asking you to approve the purchase of a Tomcat Pro V2 scrubber for the high school. Uh, the current one is from 2009. Uh, this will be through CoStars at a cost of $19,178.88. Uh, just so from background information, the last scrubber we purchased was $15,183. Uh, you'll see the scrubber itself, so it's about a $1,600 increase um, since 2015. Uh, the one part about this scrubber is we are actually using what's called ozone technology, is we will have no chemicals with this, and we obviously that's a cost savings, but also um, better for the environment. It essentially converts oxygen into water ozone, which helps essentially destroy, um, I guess, germ cells. Uh, so that'll be a nice savings as far as chemicals in the future. Uh, so the next one is to approve a co-stars agreement with AJ Morrow Company to replace the middle school gym athletic doors at a cost of $5,275. <clears throat> and the next one is to approve, it's a two-part agreement. It's to approve the agreement with All-American Athletics to provide uh, services both here at the intermediate middle school and at the high school. At the high school, as you know, we got the gym resurfaced last year. So essentially this will be the first year of they'll come back and refinish it. Uh, that'll be a cost of $4,850. <clears throat> and the next one is to resurface the intermediate middle school gym floor. Um, same as what they did over at the high school, but here it'll be a cost of approximately $38,000. And then the next items are really for next school year. Uh, item four is to approve the proposal with alarm tech suppression out of Reading, Pennsylvania to inspect kitchen hood suppression systems at a cost of $833. The next one is to approve an agreement with SSI out of Briningsville preventative maintenance for the high school dust collector fire suppression systems at a cost of $785. And then moving on to item six, we're asking you to, this is what we went out, we did go out to RFP for this, asking you to approve the agreement from school operation services to provide con contracted custodial service for the next four years um, as presented. Uh, you'll see that we had two bidders, Pro Quality and SOS. Um, when you did apples to apples, SOS was the lowest bid. And then item seven is to ratify the Berks County Joint Purchasing Board Bid Award through Provident Energy for natural gas commodity pricing with UGI uh, for the next school year, well, fiscal year 24-25. And then moving on to item I, we're asking you to approve the BCTC operating budget of $19,287,583. Uh, that's an overall increase of $508,527 compared to last year's budget. Uh, Brandywine's portion actually decreased. Uh, our contribution will be $546,714, which is a decrease of $14,688 or 2.6%. <clears throat> and last, well, no, next one is item J. I'll say it now, but we're going to vote on separately is to approve an agreement with Kutztown Area School District to develop a combined field hockey team with Kutztown becoming the host district for both middle school and high school. If we can pause there, Nicole. Um, Andrew, sorry about it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I want to first thank the folks that uh, had the opportunity to speak and share some very uh, valid and pointed concerns about uh, the, the field hockey team program. 
uh, if I can just kind of frame this up, kind of how we got here. Um, the idea of growing a co-op program really uh, was developed starting this fall. And uh, in the fall, we were we were obviously more focused on the stadium project. Uh, field hockey co-op really wasn't a conversation. Um, and as we looked at, to to uh, improve the stadium project, we were going the direction of a grass field. Um, talking with m many, most of the field hockey parents in the community, um, there was a lot of concern with um, some of the staffing aspects as well as the ability to play on a grass soccer field. There's a inherently a disadvantage. Um, and, and that's, that's absolutely true. The more I've learned about field hockey, the more, uh, I, I absolutely respect that opinion is that the ball rolls faster. It, it's, it's a whole different game than playing on the current service that we're at with, with our, our facilities. So, um, we, we're down a, a road with a grass field, uh, stadium at our high school. Uh, we, we've developed a whole process for that. Obviously we haven't approved it yet, but we're, we're pretty far into a process. So, um, during that time, the uh, Kutztown had reached out and expressed some interest in joining together as a co-op. And originally the, the conversation was for, for Kutztown and Brandywine to join, but use Brandywine's facility. Um, because we have the nicer grass facility, we have uh, a middle scope team that's already co-opt with Kutztown. Uh, and so there's two Kutztown parents that actually are Brandywine coaches because the middle school Kutztown, uh, Brandywine and Kutztown teams are co-opt and working as a brand new wine team. So it made total sense for us to be able to work together. Uh, during these course of conversations, there was conversations about a turf field. Uh, obviously, Kutztown doesn't have a turf. They have grass. We have grass. Uh, and so was there any potential of using uh, Kutztown University? There were some preliminary uh, discussions into that. I, I wasn't super thrilled with how that went. And so kind of digged, digged a little deeper, was able to connect with the athletic director. And ultimately, we were able to use Kutztown University uh, for all their home games uh, for uh, a basically a joint team. Um, working with the athletic director, working with the scheduler, obviously Kutztown and Brandywine together, all, all working together. There's not a ton of availability because they have to figure out their space, uh, all their practices. And it's not just their athletics, but they have to share that with all their student um all their student clubs. So any of those, uh, forgive me, I forget the name, but um, thank you. Intramural sports, uh, they have access to to those turf fields as well. So there's very limited, but they are absolutely willing to work with us. They said they can promise us the the uh, games at home, uh, all, all our home games there. And then even said uh, when there's availability, they'll absolutely allow us to use uh, their space for for practices as well. So that really changed the narrative of the conversation then. Um, and from the co-op perspective, um, there's eight students, there, I'm sorry, there's 13, oh, I forget, uh, sorry, there's 13 students or 11 students on the Kutztown team right now. And we had 16 ros rostered last year. You need essentially 11 to play. So um, putting the teams together with injuries, I mean, we're, we're we're, we're getting by. We have enough students. We're definitely doing better than Kutztown's uh, high school team. But, you know, we're, we're kind of both just making it by. Um, we really started digging into that this co-op conversation at that point when Kutztown became a reality. Because if we don't co-op, there's not enough time or availability for Kutztown to have all their home games there and Brandywine to have all their home games there. So the, the co-op really has to come into play if we're going to use Kutztown University for for our, our home games. Um, the shift in narrative of us taking over the co-op to Kutztown really became a, a function of physical, physical space. Um, it doesn't make any sense, obviously, for them to come to Brandywine to go back over to Kutztown University. And so uh, the, the Kutztown, University, uh, Kutztown School District became the, the leading school district for, for this co-op. Either way, there was going to be these tough conversations, and it is very tough conversations when uh, I, I think Aaron said it great. It's it's a partnership. It's not necessarily a co-op in terms of we're adding a sport or giving kids an opportunity to play a sport they wouldn't have otherwise had. This is this is a partnership. I, I absolutely appreciate, appreciate that perspective, but we have to have this partnership if we're going to take advantage of the, the turf field 
uh, and we have to have that partnership. We don't have to, but right now the partnership and it has been approved by this Kutztown School District for them to be the lead because of physical location. Uh, part of this uh, co-op uh, and, and the stipulations are that they will add another coach to this uh, process. So there's not just a head and assistant, there'll be in another uh, assistant coach added that will represent the Brandywine School District students so that they have a equal and, and fair partnership and representative uh, for, from that process. Um, our school district would cover those costs for that assistant coach. Uh, additionally, um, transportation costs would be provided by uh, Brandywine. Transportation would be provided by Brandywine. The cost is socially associated with that, obviously. <clears throat> and then finally, any rental fees for the university or rental fees for practice facilities uh, would be split 50-50. Um, the goal for practice facilities is to be able to use one of the uh, major indoor um, turf facilities within the area. There's one in uh, the Lehigh Valley area. There's one off of um, Body Zone down, down in Reading. And then there's one off the Pricetown Road at the bottom of Pricetown Road. Um, I forget the name of it currently, but it, it's, uh, it, that's, that's a third option that they're, they're looking at. Um, I've, I've explored all those. I put pricing to that. Um, I've kind of exchanged that information with uh, Kutztown School District so that they, they have those. I, I made a lot of initial contacts to help facilitate that process. Um, I definitely appreciate the idea that we need to lock that in so there is consistency, consistency or, or know what that is. But um, I'm trying to facilitate that kind of behind the scenes with, with Kutztown right now to um, understand the importance of that. So that, that's really the, the crux of the conversation and how we got to where we are today. Uh, really started with the plain surface and turned into the availability of Kutztown, which turned into um, both teams kind of just, just making it by right now uh, and being able to merge our teams together. Right now, we have three students at the middle school that are playing on the middle school team that are Brandywine students. So there is not a lot of students that are coming through the system to grow or bolster this. So um, there's 10 students total on the middle school team between Kutztown and, and Brandywine. Seven of those happen to be Brandywine, uh, Kutztown students, three are, are Brandywine students. So um, for the, honestly, for my perspective, and, and I know this is a tough discussion point, um, especially for our student athletes that are doing it now, um, but I, I truly believe that if we don't do this, we will not have a field hockey program in the future because we have such low numbers at the middle school level to be able to make it sustainable. Coupled with, if we don't do this, we're not going to have a competitive playing surface to play on and we'll lose that opportunity at Kutztown University. So that's why I, I, we want to present this. I am recommending that we do move forward with this um, for, for all the reasons I've just mentioned. You've heard the parents' con, uh, perspectives, and, and again, completely appreciate that. Um, just wanted to share my perspective of how we got here today. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So if we, if we go with the co-op, then would all the practices be at one of those three? <clears throat> the the idea would all or a combination. The idea would be partner, make a partnership with one, uh, and then also be able to use Kutztown University as they're available. So the, the Kutztown one is the most ideal because it's locally and, and obviously a lot cheaper. Is now the time for board discussion yeah. on this? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right to the gun. I am not in favor of this. Um, I have three girls who are very active in Brandywine Athletics. And I feel like we need to give this decision more time. I don't think that we need to jump the gun right now as we are in the situation. Um, Kutztown reached out to us. They need us more than we need them, okay? Their program is failing. I don't think as a district, we have done everything that we can do to grow our field hockey program. I see the numbers for middle school, but I also know that our field hockey staff needs to do better at growing our youth programs and engaging our youth to want to participate in field hockey. 
we have a great team and we have a great following. We have families that are dedicated to this program that want to see it be successful and are willing to do whatever they can. And I'm not standing here to grandstand. I just think that we need to have pride with our sports and our district. And imagine your son or daughter's number one team, whether it's baseball, soccer, field hockey. Okay, now soccer is now going to Kutztown. How does that make you feel? Your kid's now wearing a Kutztown uniform. How does that make you feel? I'm not okay with that. Our girls deserve to wear a brand new wine uniform and play for their school. It gives them pride when they're amongst their friends. It gives them pride in the community and it builds us as a district. We have a winning team. Our numbers have shown it. We're not there yet. We need to give this program a chance to develop, get more youth signed up. And yes, I know we heard from our parents because they are passionate parents. They do want what's best for their girls. And yes, they wanted a turf field. But if you speak to them all now, and maybe that's what we need to do next. Maybe we need to have a survey that goes out and says, would you rather have your kids on a turf field or would you rather them have a Brandywine uniform and a Brandywine field hockey team that they're playing for? And from the majority that I've spoken with, they would like it to stay here at Brandywine. That is what they want. They appreciate the fact that you have gone above and beyond to try to get that turf field practice time. They would love that. And I, I question whether or not that could still be an option if we are not partnered with Kutztown. But at this point, if they had to choose between the two, and I would like to ask them that, which would you rather have? Would you rather have them play here at Brandywine or would you rather them have the turf field? because that is what it's coming down to right now. <laughs> you have to pick one. Right. Do you mind speaking? Oh, I, they can't hear you.
And I understand you have a booster club that has a $900 amount. So um, if that can help cover some of the indoor facility costs, I think they would be willing to do whatever they can to compensate those um, if we don't have Kutztown to work with for that funding. Are there other, like, Kutztown school, is there another college or school that has a turf field? Alvernia or Penn State Berks or any of those? Do they have, Albright, do they have turf fields? I know Albright does. Um, I didn't engage in conversations with the other universities just because Kutztown's the, obviously the local one. Yeah, but maybe for practice or something. So um, I also am really struggling with this decision. Um I have a daughter who's considering playing field hockey and it's, it's discouraging to not let her be a brandy wine person for the first time. So I, I struggle with that. I've struggled with it for a while when we were just trying to figure this out. And I, I know the turf field would have been really, really nice. And I understand that the path that we had to go down, um, um, I just, I worry about us moving over just like everything that was said and, uh, you know, going from a team who I saw the records when they were emailed to us and it looked like we were doing really well as field hockey players and to join in with a team who, are you sure they have 13 players? I heard they only had nine going into next year. So they won't even have a team to field. So, um, they definitely need us. And it just feels like we're giving up a, a lot to, to, for some practice time when, uh, and playing time. So, um, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to tell kids that, you know, we're giving up one to take the other thing. So I, I really am struggling with this. Um, it's, it's just not a, I, I just think that we, I think it's kind of like put us in a hard situation where we have to figure it out rather than take the easy road. That's how I feel. Let's figure it out. I feel like. And what's the worst case scenario? There's a lot wait. of, there's a lot of, I feel right? like there is a lot more kids like middle school and younger kids that I, I know personally that go to Brandywine that play field hockey. And I, I don't know if, what were our numbers for middle school? Like three years ago, like. Kutztown's going to need us again next year, right? So what is this rush? Yeah. 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 I mean, I have a sixth grader who's never heard of field hockey until her friends were telling her. And like, I'm sure she's not the only one out there to know that that's like next year, that's something she's interested in trying. Right. So I, I just think that to discount them already before we really don't know is, is, is not the right path. So that's was, that was my two cents. So. Historically the middle school numbers as combined teams uh, 9, 11, 13, and 16. So going in back in time. So 2019 was 16 but students. Combined. That's combined. But we don't know what were our numbers. That, those are the combined the, those numbers. We don't, don't know. But you said four-ish. Yeah. There was one year that, that was our lower year that we only had four girls and boys that were in the eighth grade. And then we never I do feel in general that sports could be celebrated and shown 
what the opportunities are for kids a little more. Um, I know I've talked to Sarah about having a, an, you know, an all sports assembly where our senior athletes can come and show our elementary kids what is possible. Um, and I, I think that if we present our sports a little bit more, you know, our younger kids don't know what's out there. My daughter had no idea what field hockey was until she started talking to her friends. But if you start it early enough, there could be the opportunity for our program to grow. So. I agree. Go ahead, Liz. I have a question to the folks back there. What I, cause, cause I couldn't hear if, if the choice is turf co-op at Kutztown or here, Brandywine Heights specifically, in a brand new one heights uniform on grass. What what would be? And I know it's a handful of people here, but what what's the sentiment for that? <laughs> Louder, please. <laughs> so, actually, uh, Mr. Wagman, if we just if we yeah, if we could just have the people that want to speak, if y'all would just come up to the front, just so that we can hear everything y'all have to say. Thank you. So, uh, first of all. That's a really hard question to ask a teenage kid because they're torn between two worlds. Okay. One of the things that was described earlier tonight is who do they want, who do they want to play in front of their friends in the school that builds school pride, right? That night that you guys let them, and I'm going to thank the principals over here because I know Mr. Gates was, was a big part of this happening and Mr. Frino, but the night that you let those girls play under the lights here, and their friends came to watch them play, and it was Brandywine Pride in that stadium, meant the world to them more than anything that happened in that season whatsoever. So, so when, you, when you build something like that in the culture of your district, you are building what's on my T-shirt right now It's a sense of pride. Okay? They both want to play field hockey in college. A predetermined of that is turf field. So you're asking them to have a really tough decision between what do I do to prepare myself to go to college or do I want the high school experience of playing in front of my friends? Okay. I'm not even going to go off on where I feel this district is moving with your decision making right now, but not putting a turf field into that stadium was a big mistake for the future of many reasons. It was many reasons a big mistake. And if you want to turn this school into a soccer school, then you're probably making the right decision. But if you want to build a community around something, we were just up at Palmerton. Palmerton. People say, who's up in Palmerton, right? You should see their facility. Go visit it. Another beautiful facility in a small district. Again, it builds a culture in your, your district. That's what they want. They want the culture. All right? I'll let them speak on their own, but I, I was, as a father, going to protect a little bit of that conversation because you really have kids that are torn in two worlds. But I will tell you that world that was over here that night under the lights meant the world to them. And if you think kids are gonna go from Brandywine to watch them play in Kutztown Stadium, unless if you promote, unless you promote your, acad your academics, your athletics and your arts program much more in this district, people aren't gonna know about it. that school pride. It's not gonna be there. I'm just saying that from experience. Um, like he said, having that game at the middle school field was like incredible to me, actually playing in front of everybody was it felt great. And then like everybody was talking about it afterwards and they were like, they were like, oh, I didn't even know field hockey was like this or this was the rules, blah, blah, blah. But since they came, they like all started understanding it and they were like, oh, we need to go to more. So it's really hard deciding between getting to play on turf and like preparing myself for college, like he said, or getting to play in front of the people who care about me and the people who will support me and what I love doing. So I don't know. Yeah, but most of it is like over the summer and it's not too much. So it's kind of hard to prepare for that much time because High school, we play. We would play more games than we usually do outside of school, so I only get a limited amount to play on turf. So, like honestly, having turf would be great, but.
but it's fine if we don't have it. But just having the experience to play in front of people who I'm friends with and to show just support for field hockey, because clearly it's not shown enough. I mean, we barely have sometimes a youth. We don't even have a youth program. So, I mean, I feel like putting it out there and getting more girls to see what field hockey is and what it's about would be awesome, especially to get more of like a middle school program would be great. Thank you. So, um, thank you, um, moms and dads and um, young women. Fabulous, very courageous to speak in front of this group, particularly on a controversial topic. So, um, this uh, I echo some of the um, angst in terms of this decision. My understanding was that the problem we were solving for was the fact that we were heading in a direction that was grass and the field hockey program at Brandywine was demanding access to turf. So my understanding is for the past six months or more, this group of collective people has been trying to solve for that problem. What I'm hearing tonight is very different. And so that's why I'm struggling with a vote this evening to take us in a direction to solve a problem that doesn't appear to be the problem um, or not the no longer the primary problem. So it feels to me like there's been a shift, um, a very dramatic shift. And so to hear the folks immersed in the program say, we, we as a board and as a district would be jumping the gun to form a partnership with Kutztown, um, I don't really need to hear much else. Why would we do it if these folks are begging us not to? There's no cost savings implication. There's no urgency in terms of a deadline. Um, I just, I'm not sure that now is the right time to make that decision. I don't disagree that if these um, numbers and commitment and dedication and um, publicity for the program don't improve dramatically over the next couple of years, we will find ourselves in um, a difficult situation yet again. That we will grass, not be able to, that we will, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, turf, yeah. grass, <laughs> turf, whatever, but we might not have the same good options to solve it in a few years. So um, I think that's part of the concern. Um, it just seems to me like right now, I, I'd have trouble supporting moving the program to Kutztown. Um, the other thing I really would want to, even if the board decides to do that, it is not a co-op. It should not be branded a co-op. It should be branded a partnership. It is totally different than the volleyball thing and the football thing and the other things we've done in co-op with Kutztown. This would be a partnership. And I think costs should be split 50-50, not just for field expenses, but 50-50 for coaching, 50-50 for all of it. So um, that would be my push and that there needs to be a lot of involvement. I, I, you know, got some vibes from the Kutztown folks that they're saying, hey, look, you're coming to us, we're in charge. Mm, that, that's not a vibe that to me feels good when it's a partnership. So um, anyway, I, I, I'm not in support based on what I've heard from the audience tonight. I have trouble supporting. And, and that's not to say you didn't do a yeoman's work trying to figure this out. Um, and I think we can really leverage if it stays here. I think we can really leverage a lot of the work that you've done and a lot of the learning, um, Sarah, that, you know, that you probably have um, come upon and in partnership together, maybe we can um, take another crack at keeping it in-house. But, and I, I appreciate the, the comments. Um, my biggest concern right now, and if we if we keep it here, that's completely fine. That's that's where we need to be. If we don't keep it here, if we keep it here and say we're going to evaluate this down the road, and we say no to this offer now, it is not going to be an offer that's going to be on the table again. Because because of the direction that we're going to burn bridges with the university and we're going to burn bridges with the Kutztown School District. They've already approved this. We're in a, we're in a direction. There's limited space 
and time available. They will capture that space because it really becomes them that owns that then. Um, and so that will not be an option. Now, maybe we can find something at, at Albright or Alverney or something like that, but um, that's my hesitation. And my, my secondary hesitation is, I don't know if we're gonna have the numbers to be able to sustain this long road. We have declining enrollment district-wide. Um, right now we have the highest number of students in our high school. We have classes of 80 and 90s coming through. And so maybe if we, if the parents and if there's youth programs that can start, it does make a rally and that's phenomenal as long as we're all under the agreement that if we do this, we are locked in to playing on grass, at least for the foreseeable future, exploring other options, of course, but the knowledge that right now we're turning down a turf option for the competitive playing field, which originally was the, the concern and the problem we were trying to solve, even up to, we had a parent meeting with everybody and, and the, voice of concern of I'd rather have a stay here and be on on grass really wasn't a conversation it was more of can we can we take over and, and still be the ones in charge but use but use Kutztown uh, so most recently obviously tonight's conversation does change the narrative a little bit and that narrative changes from we'd rather have that here than play and give up the competitive playing service what I'm trying to suggest tonight, whatever decision it's made, is if we decide to move forward with Kutztown University in this agreement, then we are choosing the competitive playing surface. It obviously means that we're going to combine teams. I do not believe that is going to be a negative. Um, you lose some of that hometown, you know, kids watching, but I do believe there's inherent benefit for playing together with other teams and other athletes. In another, another school district, it, it's been successful in other, all our other co-ops. If we choose to keep the program here, then we keep that hometown pride and we get to play in front of our own students. And, and, and that's a great thing, but we're giving up the competitive playing surface. And, and I know you don't want to make that decision. And I know you voiced the concern of, we don't want to have to make the decision, but we have to make the decision. That's what's in front of you tonight. And I just want to make sure that that's kind of laid out, whichever way to grow, we'll absolutely support it and move forward. But I just want to make sure that the board understands the direction you're making with the vote tonight. If you vote yes, we're going with turf. If you vote no, we're going to play here on grass. Okay? Just so everyone's on the same page. Cool. I do think that the fact that Kutztown was able to vote before us is a little... Like, I understand we changed our voting. Like, we should have asked them to push it back as well. Or... I, I just I, feel like I don't I do not agree with that. Um, I well, we of, were supposed to vote both voting on the same night to make it a unilateral decision. We purposely decided to not do that so that we could have better. public audience. So I do not believe we should put any blame on Kutztown for voting at a different. No, I, it's not a blame on Kutztown. It's saying we should have come say, hey, let's make sure we try to vote on this at the same time. Which did well, yeah, we pulled the audience. Yeah, I know. Well, we should have gone back to him and said, would you mind pu pushing yours back as well, I guess. I, that's, it just feels like now it's like, well, they already made the decision. So, yeah. And, and similarly, I'm not sure it has to feel punitive to them that we're, if this board decides not to proceed, why does it have to be punitive? Couldn't we take the approach to say, um, we're uncomfortable with the structure of the proposed co-op we'd like to step back and w continue to work on framing up a partnership. Yeah. And m maybe we could practice to get, yeah, maybe this practice. is a stupid idea and you guys would hate it, but yeah. could we do joint practices on a turf field and still maintain competitive separation? Where anyone has its program and its coach, Kutztown has its program and its coach, and the two schools join together and rent turf practice fields at KU and wherever else makes sense and split those costs. Then you'd have plenty of people to practice. Um, it'd be awkward when you have to compete against good stuff. But again, they know would be players. at the disadvantage because they wouldn't have enough players to even scrimmage. Right, right. I uh, just, so I it's like we are definitely having the upper hand. And let us remind you all that we are the ones that were division champs. Mrs. Well, as if I can just cut you off a little, I don't, 
I feel like you're being very negative to the Kutztown students. Those are students just like our students sitting here. Yes. And you're basically also telling them that they're not allowed to have that opportunity because if we if we co-op, it's too bad, too so sad, and making uh, a this some declarative statements that are they're not as good. From well, a, I've been voted you know, on so behalf of the top ten I, I population, that, but this is and that is who I represent. That and I, I am in no way putting down Kutztown students. I am here to represent our Brandywine students, Mr. Pottinger. Mr. Wagner. Hey. Ms. Wagner, if I could just be recognized for a second. Um, Mr. Potter, I completely understand where you're coming from. All right. It is it is a difficult situation. However, this board is we are servants to the community. We are servants to their wishes. If Kutztown decides to get their nose out of joint because we are completing our duty to our constituents and to our students, that's on them. That's not on us. All right. We have been presented with information that is vastly different than what we initially thought it was going to be. If the will of the community is that we keep it here, they need to understand that they have to do work as well. All right. You look at the basketball team. You look at the volleyball team. In both of those situations, that was a parent-led initiative that created youth programs that fed into the system that was enabled those systems to grow to the point where our basketball team in the middle school is literally a clown car when those kids get off that bus. It is amazing how many children we could fit on that bus. All right. So that would be something that they would have to understand is that that is a it is a community thing. Right. It is, a, it is going to be a community effort to grow this program. It's not just going to be, you know, uh, you know, Sarah is going to have to create these youth programs. It's going to need input and it's going to need elbow grease from everyone, from all of the stakeholders, all right, not just the school district. Um, with all of that being said, I would like to call the question. I understand what Mr. Sheets is saying, and, and certainly he makes a, a good point, I believe. Um, my question is, people get angry when they think they've been slighted. I'm just considering any retribution to our kids going over to them and playing football. What if they decide, well, the hell with them, then. They're not coming over here and playing football. What do we do with that? Say, oh, well, then the hell with the girls. They're not coming over here and playing volleyball. Where does this end? I don't like any of these options, to be honest with you. But we're going to have to pick one that I think is at least reasonable to all parties concerned. One thing that I will, well, there's two things I will say. To Mr. Pottinger's point, as far as making this a turf war, that's not it at all. These are correct, and that's what I'm saying. So to say their students, we're not doing that with their students, so vice versa, that's never came up as a conversation. So where that all came from, I'm not sure, but that's not how we've operated as a district ever to say, okay, it's Kutztown, so heck with it and we've always been cooperative with all our surrounding districts and we'll continue to be so if this is a blip in the road let it be a blip in the road and let it be that let the rest of the crap go go to the wayside the other thing i will add is that any youth program that is currently in this community is hurting and that is a feeder program to our middle school and our high school team field hockey does not have a feeder program so when you take an organization like baseball who's been around forever they have no u12 team there's no u12 children in the byb program we have a diminishing enrollment it's not not to our faults there's no homes for sale there's no developments there's nothing coming in we have one development that's a trailer park there's a spot in the there, there you go <laughs> so to your point i think exactly that it takes a village so if, if, if the, the will is to have a field hockey program that is going to thrive, that needs to, that doesn't start at the school district. It can be an ending point and it can be a part of the program, but it cannot be the end all be all. So that needs to start at a grassroots and say, 
here, we're, we are creating this feeder program. Let's turn it into something. And that's one thing I'd like to add. Like, like I said, I'd like to squash the Kutztown turf war nonsense. That's, I don't care what the topic is. That's, there's no place for it here. Um, and then furthermore, like to your point, it takes a community. So whatever that is, it's going to be just whether it's playing on grass or turf, it's going to require community to continue to have those children feed into this program. So, yeah, I, I would echo that. I, I don't I think as professional folks in the public education space and given all of the relationships we have across Kutztown and Brandywine to think that um, this would be positioned that way it just makes my skin crawl. I mean, that's ridiculous. I just don't anticipate that happening. And that's why I'm saying, I don't think this needs to be punitive in any way. If this board were to decide not to proceed tonight, that doesn't mean it can't come up for vote again next month after, or the month after, after folks get to recalibrate, if you will, and flesh it out a little, a little more fully to ensure that both parties' needs are fully being met. So I, I don't think this is a screw you, kiss off. That is not what this is. If we end up, at least that's not what my vote will be in any way. It's, uh, oops, we're not quite there yet. Let's see what we can leverage about all of the negotiations you've um, been successful at doing and see if we can't come together and frame it more as an equal partnership with um, the kids first. <laughs> I, I just like to reiterate too that with the question of earlier, uh, like the decision making that we're going to be either making or postponing as far as what we're, what we're doing here. And, it, and if we do do it here, if the choice is made to do it here in the future, I think a, a strong possibility or realization of a grass field is going to be like, like it or not, that that is going to be the surface that we're going to be playing on most likely. So, that's, I hope everyone can get their mind wrapped around that, even if that's not the desired prep for college and, and, and future endeavors. But uh, that's, I don't know, I didn't word that too well, but I, I hope people realize, you know, if we keep it here, that's uh, a direction we're strongly headed. All right, so moving on to item K, we're asking you to approve a one-year service agreement with St. Luke's Occupational Medicine out of Bethlehem to provide drug and alcohol screening services as described in our pre-employment drug policy, uh, effective July 1 of 2024 through June of 2025. Essentially, this is something that we've been trying to work on for quite a while now. Um, we use Quest to do pre-employment drug screenings, but with our partnership with St. Luke's, we were looking to strengthen that um, and also the accessibility to employees. So by moving to St. Luke's, they can really go into almost any walk-in same-day service to get any pre-employment drug screen. 
And on the bright side, there was also an $11 decrease. So the cost will go from $61 to $50 per test. Item L is to approve the first extension of the current agreement and addendum with substitute teacher services, effective July 1 of 24 through June of 25. And just an FYI, this agreement is eligible for two one-year extensions, so we would have one additional year after that should we choose to use it. Item M, uh, this is a periodic thing that we do. This is to ratify the updated roster of bus drivers provided by Christ Transportation uh, for the current school year. Item N is to designate Arthur J. Gallagher of Pennsylvania as the 2425 insurance broker of record. <coughs> Annual premium costs will be provided as part of the board agenda. Uh, so something that we do each year um, that we may not have noticed, I know there was a couple questions, is essentially we designate an insurance broker for the next upcoming year. And what the insurance broker does is really goes out to the carriers and shops our, our insurance package to get the best rates. Uh, the reason we are making the change, um, one, it would be nice if we get better pricing, but Essentially, we were looking to increase our partnerships with our current vendors uh, now that we have an education foundation and just um, some other initiatives. So we did kind of an informal RFP process and Arthur J. Gallagher um, was really the company that we chose to go with. Um, and they all are also sponsoring the senior luncheon. So that was something um, to highlight as well. Uh, the next one. Item O is to ratify an agreement with Garage Strength for contracted track and field throwing for a track and field throwing coach from March 26 of 24 through May 31 of 2024. <clears throat> and just kind of an FYI on this one, uh, there were some questions is essentially this is we are not approving an agreement with an individual person. Uh, we are approving an agreement with a company, Garage Strength. Uh, so like other, I guess, third party contracted vendors for personnel, they've always been approved under the business and operations section versus the personnel. Um, you can see this evening we have SOS, STS, uh, they all go under the business and operations rather than personnel. So while there's really one individual that will be providing the service, um, it, it is truly a partnership with a company. Uh, item P is the motion to approve the contract from Digital Scoreboard for the design, build, install of the 13 by 22 foot integrated video display, the scoreboard sound system and track and timing system <clears throat> for the new high school athletic field uh, as attached in the amount of $206,895. Uh, you will see the breakdown below. So essentially you're, we're getting a video display board uh, of 139,000 stadium sound system of 54,000 finished links, which is the track timing system as it'll also have a result TV track package and on-site commissioning for the total cost of 206,000. Uh, this was something that was highly discussed in the construction committee. Uh, but the one part that I think we really emphasized when we decided to go this direction for a video display board was this is essentially more than a piece of equipment that will be used for athletics. Um, it essentially benefits, you know, arts, athletics, activities, um, any student, you know, you know, even instructional things that they might come with in the future, uh, maybe it'd be coursework, whatnot, um, as well as that allows us to host, you know, probably our most, most memorable event for a student is graduation. Uh, and also um, from a financial impact, that would also save us about $7,500 annually. Uh, should we bring graduation in-house? Um, so again, this is really about, you know, really all the students and all the community for this. Um, a lot of, you know, the parent-teacher organizations can do fundraisers, the clubs can do fundraisers, uh, we can have movie nights. Uh, so there's really a lot of opportunity within the scoreboard. So that's something I wanted to point out that it's simply not just the scoreboard. Uh, and last but not least, item Q is to approve the 24-25 PSBA package membership dues of $10,542.40 and the policy maintenance package of $1,525. <clears throat> this is a $502.02 increase from the prior year. All righty. Any additional comments? Yes, sir. 
item P. Um, the construction committee consisting of myself, Mr. Wagaman, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Oh, oh, and who's left? Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> I'm only kidding. We have been in depth for almost two years, if not a little bit longer than that now, on preparing all the things we need to do for this particular project. And over the over those two years, there's been a lot of discussions about a lot of different things. One of them is the scoreboard itself. We have an existing scoreboard on the field, which is not worth much. <laughs> but it's on existing structure to support it. And all the discussions during our meetings over the last two years was that the angle of that scoreboard was not conducive to a good view from anybody sitting in the bleachers over along the side. So we had decided that we should relocate that, give it a little bit different skew, so to speak. Now, if I understand this correctly, we are committing ourselves to reuse that existing structure. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So my question then is, has anybody done a structural analysis based on the size of this fan uh, uh, scoreboard, and view, whatever you want to call it? Has anybody looked at that structure from a structural standpoint for wind loading or any of the, any of the things that it really is going to have to endure? Have we had a structural view of this? Yes. The, the owner came out uh, with another representative, flew in and did a physical on-site uh, analysis of is it. Is he and a structural engineer? He, I don't not, know if he's not, a I don't want to hear, I, I just don't want to hear. Well, it looks good to me. But he, no, he's the owner of the company that is okay. putting his stamp of approval. All right, so it. with that being said, I haven't read the contract. I don't know if Mr. Pratt has or not yet, because this says pending solicitor approval. So maybe you can answer this question. Is this a fixed price not to exceed contract? I have not received contract. You have not received. Okay. So here we are. I have some questions on this. You know me. I'm a fixed price contract type of guy. I don't like any surprises, you know, after the fact where we get billed for hundreds of thousands of dollars, which we have in the past. So I'm trying to avoid that, number one. And the other thing is, next Monday, we're having a meet with Mr. Hormo Arcaterra, and I think he's going to be reviewing all the bids for the rest of the construction of the project going on there, I think. Is that, am I close? April 25th, those bids are coming in. What are we doing next week? We're going through timeline, through timeline. Okay, so it's, so it's two weeks away, then, basically. Or so. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 My, 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 my problem is, What if, the, what if the sign guy shows up and he says, oh, gee, I, I missed that. I would like that contract to, first of all, be a fixed price not to exceed. And I would also like to say that it should also include in that contract that any changes that would be required to that particular existing structure be borne by that company. Can we do that? So it it is a, Nicole was just, it is a fixed price contract. That's good. Um, what, what was your what my was your only concern is question? that he overlooked something and now when they go to hang the thing he says oh gee i didn't see that these were only eight number eight wide flanges here there should be 10. whoops now what do we do so any changes that would be have to made to that particular existing structure they would no charge i think we can do that can we not mr pratt sure you know, is that long both parties agree Okay, so I don't know if that's in there because he didn't read it yet. So tonight, we're supposed to vote on this, but we don't know what's in the agreement. I'm hesitant to say that we should vote on it tonight. Who installs this, that company? Or they, they do. They do. They have like a partnering company, a sister company that, that does the install. Is that considered a third-party installation? I'm not sure how it's for it. It just says the warranty does not cover a third party installation. So we, we're using their installer yeah. that they designate. 
Correct. Correct. Because if we would try to do it ourselves, okay. I just avoid the warranty. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the de the design, they went through that whole. They came out and looked at our structure, but also they did kind of a, an analysis through their engineers, um, essentially. Because at first we we actually changed it because I think the sound system was on top, and then because of the wind load and using the existing structures, the sound system is actually like basically the bottom panel now. Um, so that allowed us to use the existing structure. Um, so yeah, they did their engineering, I guess, mathematical um, detail just to make sure that it was a feasible to use this. Does anybody object to my suggestion that we still include in that contract that any thing that they may have missed would be borne by them at their expense, not our expense? Well, Any, any anybody have a problem with putting that in the contract? Not opposed to it. What was your proposal? I'm sorry. Pardon? What was your proposal? My proposal is that we also included the contract that anything that the structural engineer who was with there and, and did an analysis of it, if you miss something when it comes time to hang on that sign and it only makes itself apparent at that particular time, who's going to pay for any uh, remedial work that has to do to that structure? We don't want to pay for that because he's got a fixed price contract. Yeah, we're gonna need to we're gonna need to strike section eight from the terms and uh, conditions. What's that say? Section eight's for existing structures. It basically states that we are responsible for anything that goes on. We we hold them not liable if there's something goes wrong with the existing structure, um, and it recommends that we have the existing structure reviewed and certified by a licensed structural engineer. Okay, so there we are. From a timing perspective, I understood Mr. Pottinger and correct us if we're not getting it. This was urgent to put on tonight's agenda for what reason? If we do not vote on this tonight, let me back up. The approval of a scoreboard was taken out of the original bid documents. So it, it's on us to install the scoreboard and the sound system. The bid documents do include where the conduit lines are going to run for electric, for the IT, and all those things. It's imperative that we have this scoreboard company or whatever scoreboard company talking to the architect to ensure that those things are in line so that those conduit lines are going to the scoreboard as it sits now. Um, right now, actually, the bid documents show it going to a new location, not to the existing steel. We were able to cut about forty, fifty thousand dollars out of the cost by using the existing steel. That's why we wanted to do that. Um, but we need to put an addendum out to all those bidders to say you need to adjust your scope to reroute conduit to make sure and they're not running the actual electric lines and not running the IT lines, but they're running the conduit to get there and that's part of the project. If we don't do that, it's not the worst case scenario. What we'll end up having, though, is we'll have to work with the architect to come up with a um, some loose language to adjust it, or it might end up being a change order for con for conduit changes. When the that would be much proceeds. more minimal than any Section 8 requirements should it be necessary. I mean, they're pointing out exactly what I'm afraid of on that. I didn't read Section 8. I'm sorry, but... Uh, That's okay. Uh, I'm glad we, we have that there. So, you know, to sit here and approve it tonight without knowing what's in that contract, per se, with Mr. Pratt's uh, having read it, read it yet, I would be reluctant to proceed with this if we can't put it on hold, even if we need to call a special meeting later on to uh, to speed it up. I think, I think it, we need to have, take a little bit of a time out here. You know, we can always hold a, a public meeting, just advertise it. We're here 20 minutes after we're satisfied with what we're voting on and go from there. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I, I agree. Number one, I hearing that we're about to um, be asked to vote on a $200,000 equipment contract that has not been reviewed and approved by our solicitor makes me exceedingly uncomfortable. That just does not flow with the way we do our business. I understand that time is of the essence. My initial reaction 
to this recommendation was um, not favorable. It, just because, again, you all know I'm exceedingly frugal. Two hundred grand for a school board to me, like we could, we could build a building for that. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I did review the website of the company. I did read some of the language in the contract. I did scope out the president. They just did a merger. They're really big into advertising and marketing. I hear what you guys are saying in terms of how this can be positioned far more than just an average scoreboard. It's now like a video technology promotional thing that Brandywine can really leverage in a multitude of ways. So I've kind of gotten on board in the past 24 hours, despite the exorbitant price tag. But logistically, part of what you're selling us on this is installation is free and that saves us considerable money. So, um, yeah, I, it doesn't sound like we have all of our I's dotted and T's crossed. And it's also concerning if the if the scoreboard was placed inappropriately in the past, what is our solution? Why would we slap a $200,000 board on a post that aren't angled right? To save so, $40,000. So, so it'll, it'll save the money. I mean, that's obviously a driving factor. And I appreciate that um, from... But I'm, I'm not. Be, I'm not be, saying it's undoable. I'm not saying it's it's going to be totally out of the question. You know that somebody, the viewing public, would not appreciate what was there. I'm not saying that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying we got to make sure that everything is going to be no more than that two hundred one thousand three hundred ninety five dollars. Yeah. But I don't think it was, so, that it was wait, inappropriately can, placed. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Good. That wasn't the the scoreboard isn't inappropriate. It's just for how we wanted to eventually be able to use the other side, it was angled and just for ease of view, it wasn't meant that it was inappropriately placed. It was, I say it's inappropriate for what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think it it was just more inconvenient at at that angle. But has that changed? And we wanted to- Improve it. I think it was more we wanted to improve it and Hmm. we were including it in the dollar amount. I don't think it was, I think you could have gone back and say it was one of those add, subtract, you know, change order type things. Like if we knowing what we know now. So if I we mean, agree I don't know to, if you're okay with that though. Yeah. So. So, what you're I, saying is if we agree to live with it, it's not a travesty. It's not a mistake. Yeah. It's it's still going to be very easy so, to see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the way the scoreboard is now, you can see it from the audience pretty well. What we are trying to do is make it perpendicular and straight with the field. So if we were going to do movie nights, you could watch straight on. And it, mm-hmm. the biggest concern was those from the visit from the, the home and visiting players section side that it's angled like this, and it was it was hard to see. If you use a regular scoreboard system, Mister Happner is right; it's it's hard to see with a TV screen type system. We had people come out and evaluate that. It, it is much easier because of the the way. It's a whole different system. We're not using we're not using the scoreboard anymore. We're using essentially a TV, and so it, it gives a whole different resolution to it. Okay, so that that's so that one is it. less of a concern or yeah. a showstopper. Okay, yeah. So so I have a suggestion. If we table this, can you still go to the architect and say, "Hey, bidders, slight um, update." Can you give us two quotes, one to run the wiring to the existing thing and one to run it the way we, the bid documents say, which is a new location? Personally, working from experience, I I do this work every day. Today, I check the conduit plan, okay? It's not going to be a big deal, I think, for Mr. Horn to go back and say, Rev 1 or Rev A, conduit now goes this way. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not that includes more conduit, less conduit, we can live with that. I mean, conduit is basically cheap compared to what we would be getting ourselves into trouble here. Right. So I wouldn't be worried about that at all. Yeah. I'm okay. sure Mr. Horn can ha- can handle that with verbally almost. So let, I, I think the, the general consensus, let's table this. I, I think that's very appropriate. Let's go back and see if we can get that item out of there. And if we can get that item out of there, we can either decide to come back in a quick meeting and and just vote on that one item or if that's not necessary based off of our conversation with the architect then we can wait till may and we can in the meantime make sure the documents are right yeah and and give mr pratt an opportunity to to review the rest of the of the contract as well for anything else he may deem unsuitable 
That's fair. One yeah. other one Go. other caveat. Um, the the president of the company who came here from Florida or wherever to see everything. Please keep in mind he's a sales guy. <laughs> he's not a structural engineer. So he and whoever he brought with him, unless they are credentialed to make these decisions and unless contractually they're willing to honor what they claim. I, I would even go uh, be careful because his job is to sell you the deal and then manage the aftermath. Right. I would right? even go so, as far to say that who could review any he, he has people. Yeah. He could review that thing there for what we're trying to put on there now as compared to what we had talked about with him later. Yeah. Let him review that 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 structure. His structural people that works for him. We, we're using them. Okay, yeah. so we could, we could go that route. Yeah. Um, one other question. I appreciate that this company is offering like an 11 year warranty, best in the industry and five years on parts and labor. That That's all good. One of the things I was thinking about, though, again, given the considerable investment, how do we protect this thing from weather related incidents, winds, hurricane, you know, whatever, number one, and number two, vandalism. So what if some drunk kid throws a rock insurance uh, yes but how expensive is it how much downtime do we have any in-house capability to fix that kind of stuff and if not how crazy expensive is it to bring in that technical expertise yada 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 so again not showstoppers but certainly considerations that we should have a plan in place for and a budget in place for so it would we actually fall into this <laughs> it would fall under our property and equipment, our general umbrella of insurance. So it really would not impact our insurance, um, considering the amount of assets that we have in general. Um, we I mean, have a deductible, though, right? right? Correct. Yeah. Um, but as far as us repairing it in-house, we would have to go to the vendor just because it is under warranty. Um, I think if we would try to repair it ourselves, it would void that warranty. Yeah. At some point, let's say it's way down the road and now warranty's out. They the way they described it to us. Now, of course, we didn't, you know, we're run out of their plugging and playing and doing it, but they said essentially these scoreboards are built in panels. And so it ends up being a seamless screen. But if something happens, you throw a rock and it breaks this panel, you pop that, you, you unplug it, you take it off, you put a new one in and plug it back in, and it it syncs up. One one of the testimonials was they had that situation in one of the school districts and had a real big event. I don't know what home gun was just, and the company flew out the next, got on the plane, and by they were there by lunch the next day to make sure it was up and going for that event. So it, 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 it's a very reputable professional company. That's why I feel comfortable recommending this because it's one that if we're going to do something like this, it is outside of our norm. It's a big investment, <coughs> but it's one that if we're going to do it, let's make sure it's done in a way that's user friendly and we have the support behind it. And can, can I just make one, it, this is not, I just want to make clarification. The, the scoreboard itself is the 139,000. We were going, the sound system, we were going to have to do no matter what. So we, we were at 54,000 is what we had budgeted. And then the finish link system that was there. So really when we're doing a comparison, the, it's a big number of 200,000. The big number 200,000 is because they'll package the whole thing together and set it up. But we were going to have the fifty-four thousand dollar cost, and we were going to have the thirteen thousand dollar cost. And then the scoreboard's the one thirty-nine. It was going to be probably more than fifty-four thousand for the sound system too, because we had to run separate wires and all that. And this is all the package deal because it has the installation. So I think, yeah, right, yeah, it like this is giving us a deal on the sound system, which we needed anyway. So. I would just like to add one thing. Uh, Till we have this all said and done, we know that 201, 395 exists now. And if we could hold them to that and we don't have any extra and what have you, how did that compare to what we first talked about? Scoreboard, Andrew, I can't remember the numbers. But what I'm, what I'm wondering is we have expanded our scope, so to speak, mm -hmm. dollar-wise, considerable. To try to take care of everything we're trying to take care of. And we've been, we've been eliminating and massaging and all the stuff here, you know. I want the other members of the committee to hear what I'm saying. If this is going to cost this much and we exceed what we had already agreed upon, I think we have to then start to consider where are we going to make some cuts? Where, what are we going to eliminate? 
whether it's 7,000 here or 4,000 there, whatever, you, to try to keep it within that ballpark. Or we're going to go whammo. And we don't want to do that. So the if we just put in a plain old scoreboard, um, it would be about 60 to 70,000. Yeah, I was going to say 70. 60 to 70,000. For, for scoreboard just alone. A, just the scoreboard. So, no, you know, numbers. Right. Okay. This is 139. One of the ways we're going to offset some of that is we just approved that contract with St. Luke's. They're going to give us $50,000. That, that's wonderful. Right? I, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> oh, we said thank you. Yep. <laughs> You know, but you understand what I'm saying. I agree, and you know, we're still this, over budget. This, this is this is much more than what we had discussed at those meetings. Correct. And I just want to I want to be on record that if we have to, that we don't exceed what our goal was before, our budget was before. We're going to have to start looking for other places, whether it's maybe uh, cutting back on bleachers or things that we discussed in, in the past. There, okay. Yeah. But we now, also I know if this did say too that we wanted something a little bit higher and we challenged Andrew to go out and find I understand. I'm not I'm not I'm not faulting anybody. No, no, no I'm just saying we did I'm talk I'm just about saying that we would like something yes. nicer. Yes. Like Andrew go find some money. You're absolutely guess. right. And I, I'm not faulting him either. I'm just trying to come to a conclusion that we also agreed on this is it. No more than this. We told everybody I just at to make sure that everyone else is aware that we, you know we yes we, we all sat there and said yes, we, we would all like agreed to a little nicer find some money yes. to make it. So hard. I'm not I'm not faulting Mr. Yeah. Pottiger or, or Mr. Horn or anybody. You know, we had options and we, this is the option that we, we decided to try to check out. So here we are. Now we have facts that we can work with and we just have to make sure that we're not going to blow the budget. That's all I'm saying. Yes. So I really appreciate <laughs> Mr. Hefter's comment. One thought I'm having, and again, you, you guys know I'm not... I don't spend money lightly, but if this is something that we all think is truly going to um, elevate the experience, similar to what some folks in the audience were saying, bring community spirit, allow us to hold community events, maybe drive some revenue by renting it, advertising, all that kind of stuff. Um, we do have a little bit of money set aside for cool, sexy technology initiatives, which isn't part of the building budget or the construction budget. Maybe we could you you know justify using a little bit of that because this is technology related. If we're going to um, justify the purchase of it by being able to use it for curriculum type things, we probably have a little bit of money in a curriculum bucket that maybe could be applied. It then also means that those other buckets can't be used for other things. Yeah, but well, I hear what you're saying, and selling, I appreciate We're ready. I have on board. We're selling bricks to make up some money for it. <laughs> and I'm serious. Am I not? Mm. Yeah. yeah. We're selling bricks. Well, yeah. We've, we've been talking about that for about 15 years. Yeah. Well, we're selling. So is so is the the appetite to table this or to I, I would like to make a solution. motion to table this until uh, we have all the facts in, in place. If anything, I would like uh, Mr. Pratt to do his part of the job, and at the same time, maybe we, if we have the, if we have all the technical information, Andrew, as far as the size and the stuff there, to give that to Mr. Horn and let his people. It shouldn't take them that long to do something like that. It's just a wind loading, basically. Yeah. Okay. But what he needs to know is the foundation, what size members, and all that thing. So he may have to come out there and, and satisfy himself with whatever he can gain from that. I don't. I don't know that we have any history on that, on drawings or anything else like that. You know. So you see. So so somebody just went out there and said, "Well, this looks like it should be thirty feet deep, but it's only twelve feet deep." You know. Then you got a problem. Okay. So we have a motion to table the scoreboard. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Is there any additional discussion? I have. Um one question about item O. So the um, throwing coach item from Garage Strength. Yeah. Um, can you share about how many student athletes we have in the throwing category? In other words, what is the coach to student ratio? Six. Do we have any other program that has a coach for only six student athletes? Um, it would be your tennis team, our boys, our golf team there. You're here, but we've had as well as six. 
previously. Um, and if you compare it to like our distance runners and mid distance runners, we have most of our athletes are competing in sprint Okay. So, go ahead. So typically with a track program, you have four coaches. I was going to say, can yeah. you frame up, like, how does a coaching work for track and field? Please? Usually have a uh, head coach. And then typically you'll have a throwing coach because that's a very, that's a specialty. Shot put, jab, it, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, you have a, usually a jumping coach, high jump, long jump, pole vaulting. And then you'll have a running coach. The head coach will typically take on one of those roles. So in our case, the, head coach is doing more sprinting and our fourth coach is doing long distance. So you have a, a long distance coach, a throwing coach, a jumping coach, and a sprinting coach. That, that's usually your compilation of four coaches, how they run that. And when we were with Kutztown at the high school level, was Kutztown's coaching set up similar? They had their own throwing coach? Probably had eight coaches. Okay. And... I know you didn't come to this decision lightly. I know you've been recruiting for it for a long time. It just strikes me. Is there any other creative solution rather than outsourcing, paying $3,000 for 60 days access to somebody at Garage Strength? Would it be more cost effective to send those six students to Garage Strength so that they have access to the coach and that facility? Um, would it make sense, for example, to take those six kids and and send them to Kutztown for their throwing lesson uh, for three days a week. Do you see what I mean? Now, I know it probably is silly because we're investing significantly in a fancy track and field field and facility. So we want to use it. But it just, it seems I, there's six kids who need that coaching attention. But historically, we've also had six basketball kids who found a trainer that could teach them how to shoot foul shots and they went to a facility and their moms and dads paid. The taxpayers didn't pay. Um, you know, we have other situations where it's not quite so customized for such a small population. Um, so, so we, sell me, sell me, because I'm so, struggling with this. So one. actually, hold on one second, Ms. Prodigal. So with Garage Strength, they actually have a throwing university that's attached to Garage Strength. So the gentleman that runs Garage Strength, I forget his name, but he has actually trained like, it's like something like 40 Olympic athletes. I know. Right? So, so why, so don't why the would kids why, go so, there to buy that service themselves? Why does the taxpayer community have to pay for that? For well, I mean, I think, I think overall, I mean, I think there's a lot of times I know Mr. Hefner, and I'm sorry to call you out on this, Ken, but there's a lot of times where board members have asked why we pay for anything when it comes to extracurricular activities. But I mean, well, this, I is an, but see, but this is, but see, but this is, but see, but this is an opportunity for them to actually be able to train with a world-class, you know, trainer. This isn't, this isn't like, this isn't one of those things where it's somebody, it's just like patting themselves on the back and saying they're a world-class trainer. This person has put out like 40, Olympic athletes. I'm well aware. I know the caliber capability, mm -hmm. and I think it's fabulous. So I think I think my question County. would be: What then, I'm struggling with is, what would you feel is, is our obligation price? to provide that for mm -hmm. those six throwers, and you know, four more that might come along next year when those six graduate? Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? At what point do we say it exists in our community? Avail yourself of it. It's not the school district's responsibility to provide that level of specific coaching. So I think it is. And that's what Mr. Pottinger just said. You have specialized coaches that teach each one of the different things, right? So $3,000 for them to go to that coach, we would be spending the same amount of money on an assistant coach for that position. How much coaching time is involved here? And also what would be the, what would be the acceptable price that you would feel comfortable with. That might be something that we do as well. We go back and we see if we can negotiate the price down. But once again, right now, he's only about $500 more than us hiring a, a you know, a, an assistant coach that will not give us the same return on investment. Well, one of the, the things I was thinking about and I questioned in advance of the board meeting was how do we justify parity when our other assistant coaches make $2,800? Um, and they're in-house and they're brand new employees. How do we hire outside for higher than that? I understand that it's specialized and the market may bear it, 
But do we not then risk having every other assistant coach come to us and say, well, if you're willing to pay that guy three grand, why am I only worth 2,800? So essentially that three grand is actually cheaper uh, because if you're paying an assistant coach $2,800, you have, we're contributing to their pension. um, And then we're also paying their employer taxes. So essentially net, the garage strength is probably actually less. Good point. Um, So. And, and if I may, uh, for the board's consideration, um, I have been involved in track and field my entire life. <laughs> uh, throwing is not something that we can take lightly with our student athletes. There is a great risk of injury to student athletes when it comes to shot put, javelin, discus. And if the students are not coached accurately and correctly, we run the risk of hurting our kids. So to Mrs. Delgarico's point, uh, it is in line and less than the assistant coaching fee. We were unable to locate a qualified coach. This is the best scenario that A, gives our students access to a high quality, high caliber coaching as Mr. Sheets has shared. But at the same time, also looks to minimize the risk of injury to our student athletes. Anyone can go out and try to run an 800 meter, two laps around the track, right? Coaching is great for that but the risk of injury is not as significant as it is when it comes to the throwing events. A, a student can have serious permanent injury as they can in any sport. When that's why we ensure that we have coaches who are qualified and can meet the needs of the student. So I believe that is why this Avenue was pursued uh, to make sure that the safety of these students is also taken into account. Appreciate those two points. Thank you. All right. So, I'll take a uh, motion and a second to vote on item A. Aye. Right. Oh, motion and a second to take. Correct. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. You have a motion and a second to table letter B. We get a vote on that. Mr. Hunter. Yes. Mr. Hunter. Yes. Mr. Hunter. Yes. Mr. Wright now. Yes. Mr. Sheets. Yes. Mr. Stevens. Yes. Mrs. Wallace. Yes. Mr. Wright Yes. Mr. Wright Yes. Nine motion passes. Now we have a motion and a second to vote on. Don't you have to do all these? It's okay. To vote on. What's that? All items, All items except for J and P. So could I get a roll call vote for all items except J and P? Mr. Monto? Yes. Mr. Sheets? Yes. Mr. Sheets? Yes. Mr. Wright? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Wagner? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Ragnar? Yes. Mr. Ragnar? Yes. Nine, eight, motion passes. All right, now can I get a roll call vote on letter J? Oh, I need a motion and a second. For so moved. Sheets. Second. Uh, cool. No. Nope. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Ragnar? 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 Yes. Mr. Ragnar
make a decision at this time, my perspective is it's not ready to be decided. We heard significant feedback from the audience. We heard um, uh, con contrary. Affirmative would be to go into a co op with Princeton. To vote nay would be to stay the course as we currently are, which is grass field for anyone. So, and as I mentioned before, anything is decided, whichever way we go, we will absolutely support it and make sure that it's the best opportunity for, for our team. I have no doubt we will absolutely. What do we do about that? Just because we brought something to you doesn't mean that it's what we're married to, you know. It's, it is the best what we thought at the time, so we can make it whatever works. So, we want to make it work. That's great. If not, we'll leave it for now. Okay. Are you going to roll? This is here. No. Mr. Right now.
Mr. Reinauer? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Stubitz? Yes. Mrs. Walliser? Yeah. Mrs. Eisenberg? Yes. Mr. Hafner? Yes. Mr. Hounsville? Yes. Mrs. Hume? Yes. Yes. Mr. 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 Yes. Mr.